Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, so first, it's pretty exciting being here. It's my first Blaring conference. So hi, everyone. Um, OK, I'm going to talk about a few projects, actually two projects we did at a studio called PGPOI in Israel. And so let's get started. So a little bit about me first. Um, so my name is Tamir Luski. I'm a technical artist at the studio. Um, I'm also a 3D generalist, a freelancer. I have my own kind of private studio, you can say. And I'm also a software developer and an instructor. So yeah, I actually come from a totally non-3D background, biology and programming, and this just caught, the, this uh, bug of 3D caught me, and I couldn't look back since, so that's me. Anyway, um, our studio, Peachy Poi, is, um, was established a long time ago. In 85, it's actually the oldest studio for animation in Israel. Um, by this guy, Noam Meshulam. Um, he graduated from uh, the acclaimed uh, CFT Goblins in uh, France and then came back to Israel to, um, you know, to establish the studio. So the studio is located in Jaffa, a very old part of the country. And um, so we work mostly on films, feature films. Um, it's a rather new kind of avenue for the studio and commercials and some VFX. So, um, right, and the studio started using Blender about two years ago, and we currently use Blender for all 3D tasks. Um, yeah. Yes, indeed. So this presentation is actually based on a presentation our TD made uh, at a local uh, Blender conference a month ago or so. So uh, based on is kind of a you know, another statement, I kind of stole most of his slides. <laughs> so yeah, his name is Dima. He actually wanted to come, but eventually couldn't. So yeah, all right. So the first uh, project I'm going to talk about is a commercial we did for Coca-Cola, or the local distributor for Coca-Cola in Israel. Um, yeah. Let me show you the, the commercial first, and then we can start talking about it. <laughs> That's some Hebrew for you. Okay. No, that's not supposed to go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, playlists. Gotta love them. All right. So, yeah, that was the presentation. So, this is a really funny kind of um, project because the company, the local uh, bottling company, they're called, um, they called an ad agency to produce this, uh, this ad, this TV spot, and a whole campaign around it. And that ad agency called a production company. Actually, I have these nice, so this is the end client. He called this ad agency, and they called this production house. And they called us. So it's a really long chain, it's kind of stupid, I think. Could have been much nicer. It was just direct contact, but it wasn't like that. So um, these are actually all the involved entities. And you know, this causes a lot of problems, because you actually have to approve everything with everyone. So yeah, you can imagine. Uh, that this could get complicated, but actually it worked eventually. So this whole campaign was for a new pr uh, product for Coca-Cola, a small bottle for 250 uh, uh, cubic centimeters. And uh, our part was to produce a TV spot, uh, which was, as I said, part of a large campaign where they actually uh, selected uh, customers, came and were completely full body scanned, and were 3D printed. They got these little 3D printed, uh, you know, mini versions of them as part of the promotion campaign. It was kind of a big thing. Yeah, that's just what I said. And uh, the TV spot was uh, a mixture, as you could see, of live action footage and 3D animation VFX. So this was actually pretty challenging because we got just about one month to do the whole thing. Um, usually it's at least, you know, at least two weeks uh, additional to, to this one month schedule, so it was really a tight budget uh, schedule, <laughs> right, and budget too. 
Okay, so uh, let's go a little bit over the pipeline. Um, this, the challenging schedule that we had, it really required a lot of planning. So th this is how the work was divided, and generally what we try to do is as much as possible, you know, at one point in time before we move on to the next point, to the next um, task in the pipeline. So the first week, we had the concepts, uh, preparation for this whole thing, planning, uh, choosing some base meshes to work with for the characters, and you know, all the research and development. Then moving on to week two, um, the customers, the uh, production company uh, managed the casting, so they uh, casted some uh, actors for the commercial. And as soon as that was ready, we uh, you know, just ran like crazy people to f photograph them as, uh, you know, get as many references as possible. Um, so there was uh, the photography sessions for references and for textures, as I'm gonna show you in a moment. And um, then uh, at the same week, we actually had the, the footage of the offline video. And um, so as soon as casting was done and we got the references, uh, modeling started as well. And actually, about the same time as the modeling was finished, we, uh, I think this is probably more in week two, uh, we started you know, with some uh, low poly rigging and uh, you know, base uh, animation. And uh, the offline was prepared and edited uh, in week three, which is when we could start doing the camera tracking, layout of the scenes, and the animation itself. The animation continued on to week four, and we had the effects, rendering, and post-production. So this is a little bit in, uh, more in depth. And this is like, you know, the, what you can see here is, you know, the, the bottleneck, I, could, I guess you can say, which everything depends on. So you get this casting done and everything that depends on it could go right after that. Uh, photo referencing, modeling, UV, sculpting, whatever, you know. And then as soon as the, the filming was done, the, the offline, yeah, well, a few of our team members were on, on scene to take uh, lighting probes and uh, you know, get all the information about the cameras for the tracking part. Um, um, yeah, and as soon as this was edited, we could do the tracking, layout, blocking, animation, basic stuff to send to customers to see that we're in the right direction, as I'm going to show you in a moment. Render it out with lighting, lighting passes, and then move on to compositing, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later. So, uh, since this was all based on real live actors and their mini versions. We didn't really have any, you know, concrete uh, references to use. Um, the only thing we could uh, try and find out with the customers ahead of time was the direction, the style in general. So all these references were sent out to see what they were looking for. You know, um, more realistic versions or more stylized versions, cartoon style anything, and they th kind of chose something in between, which is funny, one of these uh, versions you maybe are able to see, it's a kind of tiny image, is Sintel, which is really nice for us, um, as I'm gonna say in a second. And um, so these are, you know, the kind of versions that they chose to represent the style of the characters. And uh, this is uh, just for general reference, the kind of the scale of the mini versions of the people, you know, in comparison to the bottle. Okay, then of course, uh, you know, this was kind of co-developed, the, the, the script and the, the story was co-developed, and uh, this is kind of the storyboard, though, the video board of the commercial at a time. All right, okay, then, there was the casting part. A lot of people participated in the casting, and these four guys were selected. And as I said, um, when they were cast, we could just go and um, you know take as many uh, photo references. So we actually hired a professional uh, photography uh, studio to do that. And uh, this was quite an insane, more than 700 uh, photo references taken. And um, it was very, very helpful for the modeling process, but not only that, of course, uh, we also used this for texturing as well. 
We had some video references as well taken, but they weren't really used for animation eventually. So, of course, you, many of you could probably recognize this base mesh. It's actually Sintel, which is what we used for our base mesh to sculpt the characters. And that, of course, helped and save a lot of time for you know, preparing a new model. A good model with great topology, so why bother making it all from scratch? And so they were sculpted, and these are the low poly versions of the final characters. Um, yeah, these, yeah, okay. Uh, so these are some of the uh, textures that were prepared, as I said, uh, from the images, from the references themselves. Some were actually painted over a bit, but this is mostly just, you know, the images being used here. All right, so one of the challenges is, is frequently is, is the hair. Um, so we actually use the strand rendering of the hair, uh, you know, for, for the fast rendering um, advantages. And uh, you can see here kind of the dolls <laughs> uh, with the hair uh, posed. Okay. So these are kind of the, the you know, basically very with the basic rendering of the final models sent to the customer and the, the clients. They actually approved them. So this was like the way, the, the way for it for us. Okay, moving on to the rigging. So actually, I, as I said, I'm a technical artist and my main task in this whole project was developing some automatic rigging tools, as I'm gonna say, so um, yeah. So most of this, the work we did for the rigging and the automation actually came for, for another project that I'm gonna mention later. Uh, it's a feature film and um, what we did is actually tried, uh, we started using a Rigify uh, to avoid this, these complications that you know you have when you try to move or copy a uh, rig from one character to another with all the controllers and everything, and it's like a nightmare. It's terrible, and um, so this is probably you know the main advantages of, of Rigify as a system. Um, so we uh, tested it a long time ago before I actually joined the studio. Um, but the, you know every animator has their own kind of. Uh, um, demands and uh, desires. So uh, our animators needed more control than what the basic Rigify offers um, and more customization. So the conclusion was that we need to expand on the existing code and actually you know, create something a little bit with a little bit more control. The problem is that the studio had no developers. So that's a little bit difficult to do. And one of the first solutions offered was that the rigor and the studio, Kfir, had to learn Python. And he's not a, uh, he's not a scripter, he's not a programmer, um, so of course you can understand that that was a little bit difficult. Uh, and Rigify as a system is very complex. It has thousands of lines of code, complex code, um, and the schedule was very tight for the film and of course for the commercial. So, next solution was recruit a developer, or actually, if you know the joke that you know in Soviet Russia a developer actually recruits you, or you know, so that what actually happened because I um, I contacted the studio when I heard that they're looking for developers, and since I come from a development background, uh, not a 3D background that much, uh, it was actually pretty useful. It was like a perfect timing. They was really just looking for somebody, and I came in, so that was nice. Um, and at the same time, before I actually, uh, you know, got uh, signed off by the company, um, they decided to also consult with the expert on Rigify, the one, the only, Nathan Vegdahl, <laughs> who many of you probably know. Uh, yeah, this is a picture of him actually in Jaffa on the, you know, the harbor. Okay, so Nathan was, um, invited and hosted, uh, invited to PGPOI to help us with the project, um, of the, the rigging project. So he was hosted at a studio for around 10 days, uh, in which he actually explained a lot of the API of Rigify um, and the structure of the, the code to us. This is him sitting with Kfir, our rigger, and co-scripter. And uh, it's quite amazing. He actually managed to teach us 
the API for Rigify and write three new rig types at the same time <laughs> while he was uh, at, a, at the studio. We ended up rewriting them actually, <laughs> um, but that was m mainly because we didn't really have time to test them properly. When he was there, we were just learning and some uh, of our animators needed some different kind of solutions to the rigging. Okay, so this is a little bit about the, you know, the planning of the rig. Uh, some uh, sketches done by Kfir. There are a lot of uh, nice kind of uh, sculptures around the studio, so this is one showing, you know, like the, the facial, uh, facial musculature. So the new rig types, uh, maybe I should give a little bit of a general overview. Uh, Rigify is actually built like, you know, Lego blocks. You can just construct your own rig from rig types, different rigs. So you have like a hand rig and a leg rig. And you can create a kind of weird monster that has 10 legs and four hands and whatever you want and a tail. Um, so, and they're all combined into what's called a meta rig. So what we wanted to do is create uh, new rig types that would function like our animators wanted. So the design was based on a few um, a few things: uh, human anatomy, the animators, uh, feature requests, and you know the time we had to do actually everything. This is a kind of a you know very small um, image showing the rig and some of the features. I'm going to show a demo, so I'm not going to go into that much yet. And so our new rig type and features have uh, the following uh, traits. We actually built a new torso rig, uh, limbs, hands and legs, uh, fingers, a tentacle, which is you know some general thing that you can use uh, to easily um, to easily uh, uh, curl, and uh, a face rig, which is actually was the most complex uh, rig that you can see actually at the previous slide, this is the whole monstrous, crazy thing here. <laughs> All right. So some of the nice little features we had is we have soft IKs for elbows and knees. Uh, maybe some of you ran into this. Uh, sometimes uh, IKs just jump at the elbow when you just, you know, um, you curl it a little bit and then it jumps a lot and that annoys animators to no end sometimes. So uh, Kfir found a solution for that. Um, you have full control over the stretching, uh, whether you want to stretch or not, so it's actually uh, pretty good for uh, stylized, cartoonish characters or realistic characters. You know, IKFK switching, which is quite standard. Rubber hose behavior, so you can create, you know, all these kind of weird curls and, and hoses out of limbs. <laughs> and um, you can download it for free through our GitHub. Um, we're gonna go out with a few tutorials and demonstrations in a while, um, but it's already there and it's accessible and you can just use it. Uh, at the moment, it's actually a complete replacement. You, you, uh, it has all the code of the original Rigify with our new rig types, so the best thing would be to just copy everything and replace the, the Rigify folder. But yeah, we're gonna explain this in a, a whole lot better in a few weeks probably. All right. Yeah, that's just what I said. All right. So let me show you the rig and the stuff it can do.
Yeah, playlists, as I said, gotta love them. Okay. Um, no. <laughs> Screenshots. Yeah, and dead presentations. Okay. All right, next. Um, so, when the shooting day was uh, scheduled, uh, a few guys from the studio were uh, just went there to take as many uh, references as possible for uh, you know the lighting, lighting probes, but also proportions, the environment where the bottles are supposed to stand, and and you know relative to the characters and how everything is going to happen. So a lot of references over there as well. Let me show you the animatic. How we going in the middle? Everybody get out. Everybody get out. Man, let it get past me. Let's talk some plastic. Talk about getting blasted. Everybody get out. Small is the new crew. Chadash, Coca-Cola Mini. No, not again. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that... Ugly version was, of course, to show the uh, the client the direction and where things are going and whether it's you know before we get into much work how it's supposed to look like. Yeah, this is ever gonna stop? Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. So, of course, after we had the tracking and we need to do the VFX, we needed to do after we had the footage, we had to do tracking. So, um, one of our our guys. Uh, he w had some experience with tracking, but he did not have any experience with tracking in Blender. So because of the tight schedule, the first thing he did was trying to track the whole uh, footage in uh, PF track. That ended up being quite awful because there were a lot of problems in, in, the, in what he did. And then we got back to the studio and we couldn't change anything. So we ended up doing everything again in um, in Blender, the whole tracking. Um, the first thing we did was downloading uh, Sebastian's great tutorial. That's awesome. Um, so uh, one of the amazing, amazing things, I think, about this whole aspect is that we learned tracking on the job. I didn't have any tracking experience. Another guy didn't know any tracking. And uh, the, the third guy did have, but he didn't know Blender. And we managed to do a very tight, scheduled task very quickly in a new interface, so I guess this is a very good indication of how good the tracking system is. Yeah. Okay, so after the tracking was done, uh, the scenes were prepared for layout, and this is, you know, a little bit of an example of the layout of one of the scenes. We have, you know, all the, the assets linked um, to the scene. Um, Camera, the reference, uh, reference props, everything was right over there. And then, of course, after the layout was prepared, we moved on to animation. So this was a global operation with people from the Ukraine, Germany, and Israel. Actually, Tal Hershkovitz from Tube is one of them. Is he here? No? Yes, he is. There he is. OK, so he was involved in the animation. Um, yeah. The, I guess this is one of the problematic things is that, uh, unfortunately, not many professional users know Blender yet. So uh, this is why we often you know, contact studios or people from around the world. And uh, one uh, colleague of Tal actually learned Blender for this job. So she wasn't a Blender animator, and now she is, because she had to do it for this project. <clears throat> OK. Oh, yeah. And this is crazy, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah. You, I just have to you know, appreciate it for a moment. <laughs> okay, so the lighting was, um, the rendering, as I'm going to say in a moment, was done in the internal uh, Blender engine, uh, not cycles. Uh, I'm going to get into that in a second, but we used uh, lighting probes and HDR images for lighting. Um, you were taking with this uh, HDR sphere on the scene, and it was tweaked a bit, but it was used uh, quite well as it was. And of course, the advantage is the realistic reflections and lighting, and it's very easy uh, to set up 
Um, a few uh, additional spots were used as well, just for you know enhancing shadows and specular reflections. But this is mainly the lighting, pretty simple. All right, rendering, as I said, was done with the internal Blender engine, uh, which we know at the studio very well. Um, it's being used for the feature film where I'm gonna talk about later. And um, of course the advantages are speed and the hair strand rendered. Um, it makes a lot of sense to use cycles because this is a more kind of a realistic project. Uh, but we didn't have that many people who know cycles at the studio and the tight, but the uh, very tight schedule uh, demanded that we actually get good results quickly and not start, you know, to try new things uh, too much. Uh, so that's the reason why we use the uh, BI. Uh, it was about two to six minutes per frame. Uh, it depends, you know, the complexity of the scene, how many characters are in there at the, mo at the same time, uh, etc. All right, so this is a, a little bit more about rendering. Of course, we had a layers per character uh, to hand, hand, speed up things and a shadow plane. Uh, most of the passes were used and then recombined, um, especially uh, vector blurs. And uh, we rendered things out to open EXRs so we can have everything in one file, a multi-layer EXR file, so that's very useful. Um, the post-production was done with a uh, outsource to another guy outside the studio, and he actually did this with Nuke. Um, we wanted to use a compositor, but again, it was a lack of time, so this had to be outsourced to somebody to do it in the, at the same time as we worked on other things. And he didn't know the compositor of Blender, he uses Nuke, so he used Nuke. And as I said, uh, just we took all the passes from the OpenEXR file, and, and gladly Nuke does support that. Some other programs like uh, After Effects, as, as far as I know, don't, so that's useful. Um, yeah. One of the challenges was this pack shot. The, the client, at some point, decided that they want to have a, uh, an ordinary sized bottle next to the small one so people could understand the difference. Because otherwise, you know, it just doesn't mean much. They see a bottle that looks quite familiar and they don't know, so what's new about this? Um, so uh, we didn't have that in footage. So what happened is um, a, a 3D model was added to the scene and uh, it was camera projected, uh, the, the big bottle was, uh, the small bottle was camera projected on the big bottle. So we can have two of them together the same shot. Yeah, so this was also done uh, in Nuke by the post-production guy. And um, for the effect of the, the character popping out of the bottle, 20 versions were sent to the clients and they wanted to make a million adjustments. So first it was this kind of a laser thing and then it was the ice, but they wanted, we sent them, you know, like sharp charts and they didn't like that. So eventually it became, you know, these kind of cubes uh, and a lot of small particles and um, yeah, lots of iterations until the final version was um, attained. And uh, now let's see a little bit of a breakdown of the project. Not again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, new laptop. Uh, break down, break down. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the man you've all been waiting to see. Put your hands together. Bit of boost off the floor, man. The fantastic, really. Okay, so that was that. 
And that's it about this project. So I'm going to move on to another one. Um, this is actually a feature film, Damnation. Okay, I'll just move this mouse right here. All right, called Baldy Heights that we're, we've been working on for actually ages. <laughs> it went on for a few iterations for, from actually people using Maya if, and, and to rebuilding things in Blender. And it's been going on for, I'd say, about two years with intense work. Um, so this is a, a feature-length film they're working on. It's based on a play by this guy, Fraim Zidon. And um, it has a very unique kind of 2D-like painterly style that we're trying to attain. Uh, the art, art director really wants to avoid very 3D-like uh, visuals. So yeah, that's kind of the reason. All of these textures are hand-painted, and there are really all these flaws that are inserted very deliberately to create this effect. There's quite a lot of characters there. It's quite challenging. And despite the fact that it's called Baldy Heights, there's a lot of hair, <laughs> because in this play, there's you know two competing towns, one everybody's bald in one, and at the other city, everybody has hair, and they hate each other to totally. So that's kind of weird, but it's an interesting story. And uh, so there's a lot of hair on one side of this um, realm. And uh, it's concurrently seeking funding because, you know, it's a long film, a big project, so it's kind of stuck at the moment. But of course, hopefully it will continue getting more funding soon. Okay, so since I don't have much time, I'm just gonna show you a few scenes that are already prepared from this uh, video, from this uh, film. And then I'm gonna wrap up. So this has no audio, just a few visuals. Yeah, it's all blood. Is that there? Thank you. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs> All right. Maybe you should just come here, so because it's a lot of mess. So yeah. All right. Yes, 